Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, ladies and gentlemen, depending on where you are. My name is Dawit Solomon. I am CCAF's regional program leader in East Africa and the facilitator of this session. On behalf of CCAF's uh, and our CG and NCG partners, I would like to welcome you to this virtual relay launch event of transforming food systems under uh, changing climate. This session is about enabling markets and public sector action to incentivize climate resilient and low emissions practices in agriculture. And it is coming to you live from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. <clears throat> During this virtual relay session, we will have live polling and question and answer where we hope to interact with you all to ask a question and, and participate in the audience interaction session, you may need to download the HOVA app. To get all the action, please download the report at the transformingfoodsystems.com link uh, so that you, you can get all the full idea about all the other sessions and, and an overall idea of, of the transformation uh, initiative. <clears throat> So, ladies and gentlemen, if you look at agriculture, agriculture is key for food and nutrition, natural resources management, and economic development. If you look at the region that, uh, for example, that I, we are engaged in, in, in East Africa alone, uh, about 250 million people are, in one way or the other, engaged in agriculture. And this sector contributes from 25 to 45% of the GDP. So, it is absolutely important. Overall, we can say that this sector is a strategic channel of influence when it comes to food and nutrition, environment, health, poverty, conflict, and, and migration. However, there is an over-reliance of, of, agricult of, of uh, agriculture in this region uh, on, and in most areas where we work on subsistence and smallholder rain-fed agricultural systems. Production increases often are achieved in unsustainable ways, or overall, we can say that the sector faces, for example, four major challenges environmental, economic, human and institutional capacity, and, and social demographic related ones. The other one, and which is, which is also most important, is that if you look, climate variability and change is becoming more and more, uh, bringing more and more challenge, and it's become an additional risk multiplier for agriculture and, and food and nutrition security. So the question is, how do we bring about more than 200 million farmers into appropriate market by 2030, increased profitability and market development. With a focus on East Africa, uh, this session will discuss how public and private sector stakeholders could facilitate the scaling out of climate resilient or low emissions practices to enabling market digitization and incentives. To discuss this with us, we have invited leading experts uh, from government, representatives of Farmers Union and, and Farmers Federation, private sector NGOs, and from the African Union. <clears throat> so, uh, private, uh, so African Union. Uh, so as our first speaker now, I will invite Khalid Bomba, who is the CEO uh, of Ethiopian Agriculture Transformation Agency, give us his keynote remarks. Khalid, uh, over to you. Thank you, Dawit. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about the um, progress in Ethiopia as it relates to transforming food systems and the relevance of this very much needed report. Um, I have um, a very short slide deck that uh, I hope everybody can see. Uh, and I'll try to cover three broad areas. The first is really how does this report um, bring relevance to Ethiopia? Uh, second is what is Ethiopian government more broadly doing when it comes to issues related to transforming its food systems with particular reference to uh, scaled interventions that include both the private and public sector? And then lastly, what the organization that I lead, the Ethiopian Agricultural Transformation Agency is doing in this regard. So when we think about Ethiopia's food system, I think there's a few key themes that have been evident over the past 
10, 15 years that are important to highlight. The first is the fact that the food system itself is going through a period of evolution where the focus on production and productivity has led to substantial gains, both in terms of uh, production uh, driven by yields and uh, cultivated, cultivated land under, under, um, um, under, under production, but also an increase in yields, uh, an increase in uh, farmer incomes. Now, what's also happened is that land holdings have been decreasing in size partly through the, um, the, uh, uh, the handing down of land from, from, uh, from parents to their children. But what that's led to is an increased concentration or an increased focus on rental markets, but also other practical and innovative solutions such as the clustering of farmers to create economies of scale through what we're calling production clusters. Another main uh, major innovation that's happening over the past decade or so is an increased focus across the supply chain itself. Um, what we've seen is that the initial focus just on production and productivity to address food security issues is insufficient to really deal with the challenges of a food system approach. And as a result, there's increased focus on the market side of the equation, but also in thinking about uh, issues related to climate change, issues related to job creation, and issues that are much broader than just the agricultural system itself and includes other ministries such as the Ministry of Water and Energy, the Ministry of Trade and Industry, the Ministry of Transportation, uh, as well as issues related to logistics. So it's really a broad systems approach that we've been looking at. And then lastly, with the high population growth that Ethiopia has been facing, as well as increased urbanization, there's been a change in the diet and overall diet and consumption patterns in the country where we've seen uh, lower consumption of staple and starchy, uh, starchy uh, staples and increased consumption in animal source foods as well as fruits and vegetables. So these three macro level issues are causing us to really think much more fundamentally about a systems approach rather than the traditional approach of looking at just production and productivity. Now, in this regard, I think the report is really quite timely and provides much needed guidance on the direction and wider considerations for Ethiopia as well as more, more broadly East Africa for the next 10 to 15 years. Most important is the fact that, it, that the report itself forces us to take on a much more transformative mindset rather than thinking business as usual, because that's just not going to work anymore. And in particular, I think there are three areas that were that really stood out for, for me as I read the report that, that were um, very much in line with what we're doing in Ethiopia, but reinforce some of the issues that we've been thinking about. The first relates to a transformative approach to policymaking, because we need to think about our policies from a much more climate smart perspective that unlocks financial opportunities for all across the food system rather than in the past where we were just thinking about uh, production and productivity for food security. The second is improved land and resource management. Again, thinking about changes in mindset, which will help us think about enabling dietary transformation, but also importantly, thinking about issues such as food loss. And then finally, you know, something that we've been thinking a lot about in Ethiopia is how do we bring new innovations and technology into our food system. Uh, in areas such as early warning systems, uh, advisory services to farmers, or even just basic decision-making for uh, actors across the supply chain. Um, now, there were four big areas in the report that also stood out uh, in terms of what we're doing in Ethiopia and examples that, that we can provide. So for example, in terms of uh, rerouting rural livelihoods, there's a number of investments that the Ethiopian government's been making over the past five years that I think are very relevant. First is an investment in agro-industrial parks, four of which are being built across the country, which creates important backward linkages to the supply chains from smallholder farmers, and then forward linkages to 
urban markets, both domestic and international. There's also a, an increased focus on mechanization, uh, both when it comes to the production side of the equation, but also looking at other um, mechanized services that could be provided uh, further downstream. Legislation is being drafted to expand credit and also thinking about what can we do to improve access to women and youth in the supply chain. When it comes to de-risking livelihoods, I think a lot of people are aware that Ethiopia has, over the past 20 years, made significant investments in the productive safety net, which secures livelihoods while developing climate resilient public works. And significant investment has been made here, and lots of impacts have also been seen, both when it comes to reduction in soil degradation, as well as increased vegetative cover. Uh, there's also been, as I mentioned earlier, significant investments made when it comes to ICTs and other um, innovations. Uh, two other areas that I'll just quickly mention is reducing emissions and in realigning policies. In reducing emissions, huge investments are being made by the government over the, over the next 10 years in this regard. And then in realigning policies, there's a homegrown economic reform program that the Ethiopian government has invested significant time and energy into. Uh, lastly, just touching on what the Ethiopian Agriculture Transformation Agency is doing in some of these areas, I think there's a big investment that I should highlight when it comes to production clusters that we have focused on around 10 specific commodities, 60 different interventions. And one of the big uh, interventions here is bringing farmers together to produce as one group. And last year we had 1.3 million farmers uh, working in those types of schemes. And then in my last slide, I just highlight very quickly, and I won't spend too much time on this because I know I'm running out of time, some of the innovations that the ATA has introduced, such as the 8028 hotline, which is a farmer hotline, an extension system that has over 5 million farmers signed up, or the Ethiosis digital soil mapping project, where we have provided a digital soil map for the entire country by collecting over 100,000 soil samples analyzing them and providing fertilizer recommendations in a much more targeted way. Or the market information system that just launched last year, but is having huge traction. And then lastly, a cooperative-based seed production system that's changing the way in which seed is being produced by enabling and engaging private sector smallholder farmers as actually producers of high quality seed. So I hope this very quick and brief uh, overview of Ethiopia's activities in transforming our food system um, illustrates that many of the interventions, many of the issues that are raised in the report are indeed issues that we've been working on, but really much more work needs to be done. So let me stop there and thank you again for the time and opportunity to make these remarks. Thank you, Dalit. Khalid, thank you. Thank you very much for that insight. We know that the African Union uh, keeps uh, an agriculture transformation scorecard and Ethiopia is doing really very well. And, and the role that uh, Ethiopia's agriculture transformation is, is playing in that. So we really appreciate it. Both the insight on ATA as well as also the uh, uh, linkage with the transformation uh, uh, initiative. So thank you very much. Uh, now we will follow up with Stephen Machuri, who is Machuri, who is the CEO of Eastern African Farmers Federation, who will be giving us, you know, the farmers' perspective from Eastern Africa. Stephen, uh, over to you. So thank you very much, and I want to thank the organizers for for this particular invitation. So I have a couple of slides that I'll be presenting about um, the state of play when it comes to CSA. Uh, the issues that farmers have raised with, with that respect, and some recommendations. <clears throat> so I think we all know the definition of CSA, and I think uh, uh, FAO is very clear. It has productivity, resilience, you know, mitigation, achievement of food security, and other development goals. And um, you know, looking at the context in terms of uh, where we are at, um, for the last um, maybe the last six or seven seasons. You know, stemming from the COVID-19 challenge you're having now, we still have locusts, you know, floods, we've had prolonged drought, we've had cold, we've had uh, the fall of you know, all these, you know, uh, events have actually challenged 
uh, many value chains, there's been major disruptions. And I think this has caused a lot of worry when it comes to food and nutrition insecurity. Uh, we've seen uh, food prices spike. We've seen uh, farm input spikes. Um, there are, of course, fears about uh, food importation and the impact of that. Uh, and even now during the COVID-19, we are actually trying to look at uh, uh, the real impact of some of the prohibitions. Of course, this has resulted in, uh, among other things, you know, post-harvest, not only production, but also post-harvest challenges. Uh, I think we've seen um, the rise of aflatoxin, uh, and uh, we've also seen uh, the drop, you know, in terms of uh, low ag agro-processing capacity. Uh, the challenge to all these, among others, is that uh, the farmers actually bear the brunt of all these disruptions. And when you look at all of the risk mitigation measures, they're either not timely, not well resourced, uh, and hence they don't really cover uh, farmers properly. Uh, in fact, if, if I look at some of the many interventions that have been around, uh, we can say a lot of them have really played a lot of lip service. I mean, when you look at, for example, discussion on climate finance, uh, I think it's become a mirage as far as the farmers are concerned. Uh, access by them is a challenge. We look at all of these COP meetings that we attend. Um, you know, the decisions far and wide are viewed to be quite exclusive when it comes to farmers. When you look at even government preparedness, when it comes to all these events, um, you know, there are challenges in terms of maybe governments have too many priorities. You know, when it comes to issues of resources, um, knowledge even uh, about some of these events, and what has happened is that uh, because of the frequency of some of these climate events, um, we have lagged, you know, in terms of how we intervene. Capacity has lagged, so we're actually playing a lot of catch-up. Um, when we look at some of the risk mitigation products, again, there's a question about you know, exclusivity when it comes to farmers. You know, they have to weigh through the jargon, you know, in terms of some of the terms in insurance, the issues of just awareness. Uh, we know there's a challenge in terms of design of the products. Uh, some of this is because of uh, challenges in terms of data availability. Uh, looking at the variety of products just for risk mitigation, not very, not very many to choose from. And of course, periods have been reviewed over time. The latest being the cash, latest cash to be in the follow moon, which was dropped off. Uh, so, I mean, there are challenges. And we even know some of those providers also have capacity challenges. When you look at some of the credit uh, companies, some of the insurance companies, there are major capacity issues when it comes to understanding agriculture. <clears throat> when it comes to issues of policy, I think this has been, um, you know, a, a, a challenge over time. <clears throat> you know, good policies are always followed by, you know, proper investments. And I think um, due to the challenges I mentioned earlier in terms of resourcing, uh, I think most of the policies are, do not, are not followed through, you know, with respect to um, investments. So there are many islands of, 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 of successes that don't really converge. Uh, of course, issues of data asymmetry. Now, everybody is falling over themselves um, trying to collect data, but you know, there's a challenge in terms of standards, in terms of how this data is collected. And I think uh, probably later uh, in the future, we may start coalescing uh, around uh, you know, collectivity when it comes to uh, data, and it, it may probably help in terms of decision making. So, what I'm saying in terms, in summary, is that uh, agriculture has so many moving parts, and there are as many moving parts as there are partners and actors. And uh, when, it comes, when you look at value chains, value chains are so diverse between and among themselves, and this even cuts across you know, various, uh, the many countries. Uh, and uh, I think the challenge that I mentioned earlier is that uh, uh, some of the interventions have been viewed to be very piecemeal, resulting in islands of success, and the general collective picture is, 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 is quite worrying. And uh, this is because um, the pace and the gravity of the climate events uh, are so quick that the interventions are actually playing catch up. And uh, hence, as a result, the feeling is that um, the interventions are not overly uh, sustainable. So what are we recommending? And what are we also doing? I think one of the things we are actually asking for is that uh, I think it's now time we have an Akate emergency fund. Um, it's, it's challenging when you look at uh, when you have these events and governments are, you know, scrambling for consolidated funds, funds that have been actually set aside for something else. Uh, when actually, if the events are so close and the impact the impact is so well known, we need to really look at how do some research in terms of how do you set up such a fund, how can it be deployed? Otherwise, we risk um, the collapse of our food systems. 
Uh, one of the things that we've seen that, that would support climate smart agriculture interventions is if the players in that space actually work with actors, for example, in trade, because we, we need to have some kind of a pool. So some of these interventions are, are actually seen to be uh, effective. Now we have the, 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 the ACFTA, the African Common Free Trade, Free Trade Area. And I think it's, it's an opportunity for joint investments and to fully explore, an opportunity to fully explore the potential of CSA uh, comparative advantages. For example, pest control. We had locusts, and what we saw was that uh, you know one country was waiting for the pet locusts to actually start getting into the other country before you know they actually. I mean, if there was a regional intervention, we know there there have been units that have actually been set for that, but they've not been funded over time. And I think there's there are these kind of opportunities. When it comes to issues of post-harvest, and I think it's, it's very critical now, uh, looking at the COVID uh, issues, uh, um, we actually need to rethink about post-harvest beyond grain, and you know, preservation, storage, and processing. So we need to look at how we can store more vegetables, more fruits, meats, milk, and create awareness about this. You know, we need to look about think about nutritional security. You know, going forward, the digitizing agriculture. I think now. Uh, is the opportunity to actually do it. As an organization, we are actually doing it. We have an e-platform. Uh, we have about quarter million uh, farmers there. We are in three countries. Uh, but the beauty about uh, digital agriculture is that uh, it creates so many other opportunities. You know, when it comes to, for example, um, you know, technology transfer, issues of logistics, finance, I mean, we, we know that. The challenge we have is that everybody is doing it. And many of these platforms are actually crumbling. And you actually need to really rethink you know, in terms of how do we improve some of the business models, the services that have been provided, deployment of the same capacity, as well as sustainability. I think uh, to be effective when it comes to CSA, we need to really think about how we can improve our decision-making mechanisms. And one of the ways is actually digitizing agriculture. Thank you very much for listening to me. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Stephen, uh, Stephen, for giving us the perspective of East the perspective from East African farmers, uh, both the challenges and, and also opportunities. Uh, and we'll get back to you on the Q and A session if the audience have further questions or they need, you know, uh, certain things to be elaborated. But thank you very much. Uh, now we will go to Fati Nazi Hassan, who is the Division Supervisor uh, on Human Capital and Institutions Development at the African Union Development Agency and the new Partnership for African uh, Development, uh, which is NEPAD. Uh, Fati, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, and uh, good uh, morning to all. I will try to be brief. I have some slides. Can you see my slides? Are you able to see my slides, David? Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So I will talk about what we're doing in the nexus of uh, uh, food system and climate change as the UD and EPAD. Uh, first, I would like to introduce what is AUD and APAD for uh, maybe the few of you who do not know uh, AUD and APAD. Uh, and then uh, touch to the Africans' approach to the climate change. And then focusing uh, more precisely on what AUD and APAD uh, is doing. So as most of you may know, AUD and APAD is the African Union Development Agency. Um, it was built on the previous NEPAD planning and coordinating agency. And in November 2018, it was created by the heads of state of African Union uh, with a twofold mandate. The first one is uh, to coordinate and execute the priority uh, regional projects and programs uh, for regional integration with a clear view to support the realization of Agenda 2063 which is a, a strategy, a blueprint, and also a vision of African development. And the second part of our mandate is to strengthen the capacity of AU member states. While doing this, we are advancing uh, knowledge-based advisory support. We mobilize the resources and we work as the technical interface for all the stakeholders and development partners. Uh, one example of the approach that we um, that we implement is to have 
a um, strategic uh, program or strategic approach and then try to see how we can uh, adapt it uh, at the regional level and at continental level. For example, on the food system, nutrition and food system implementation plan that was uh, developed and adopted last year, uh, what we're trying to do is to support the agenda 2063 and uh, support the member states in their activities and actions to address malnutrition more effectively. We're trying to coordinate uh, and, and accelerate action in order to eliminate uh, hunger and food insecurity. Uh, what we're trying to do is to have a systematic approach while we uh, advance food nutrition, food system and nutrition uh, uh, activities, we do this uh, in link with uh, climate change issues, nutrition issues, obviously human capital, environment, but also economic development uh, with uh, clear linkages with, um, uh, with regional integration, uh, movement of goods. Uh, uh, we also mentioned uh, AFCTA, this is clearly what we're trying to do to have a uh, an, uh, an integrated approach in everything we do. And the uh, food system nutrition is not an exception. Um, we are working in almost all the member states. Uh, we have a footprint in 52 of the 55 uh, African Union member states. Uh, we do not currently work in Somalia for uh, I think obvious reasons. Uh, we do not have currently a program within uh, um, Western Sahara and Morocco. Morocco just joined a couple of years ago, so we're still uh, figuring out exactly how we could uh, support Morocco. And it's also a challenge to work in uh, Western Sahara. But other than that, we work in every African Union member states uh, in diverse areas, human capital development, regional integration, infrastructure, industrialization, uh, resource natural governance, and obviously, uh, food security. Uh, when it comes to the climate change approach, we are obviously aligned with the Agenda 2063, which is our uh, guide for everything we're doing. As you know, Agenda 2063 has six aspirations, and when it comes to climate change, our activities, our support to member states fall under the aspiration number one, which is a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development. Under this aspiration, there's two goals that are uh, a guide for us. Uh, the first one is modern agriculture for incre increased production, productivity, and value addition. And the second one is goal number seven, environmental sustainability, climate resilient uh, econo economies, and communities. Um, we design and implement our support to African members, the African Union member states, uh, keeping in mind obviously our mandate, but also uh, recognizing that Africa uh, uh, contributes to less than five percent of the global carbon emissions. But in the in the in the other hand, uh, Africa is paying the price of climate change. Uh, we also know that Africa shall address the global change of climate by prioritizing. Uh, adaptation uh, to uh, climate uh, change and climate shocks. shocks. Uh, we do have a climate smart agriculture set of activities and uh, it's basically twofold. The first one is to support member states in achieving national, national climate change priorities and targets under the Paris uh, Climate Change uh, Agreement. We do support African uh, Union member states in accessing the Green Climate Fund. So we provide technical support uh, for them to be able to ac access these funds and to be able also to uh, design and uh, implement actions that are responding to their national priorities. On another hand, we also uh, play the role of, as I mentioned, uh, evidence-based uh, technical advisory. We play a role of um, knowledge broker by supporting member states uh, within three objectives, uh, sustainably increasing the agricultural productivity, uh, adapting and building resilience of agricultural and food systems to climate change at multiple levels, starting from the smallholder farmers 
specifically uh, women uh, farmers uh, up to uh, the support to um, uh, uh, govern governance and government action. And we are also trying to support the member states in removing uh, gas emission where uh, it's, uh, it's greenhouse gas emission where it's possible. Another type of activity that we um, that we undertake is through partnerships. As you know, partnership is at the core of uh, NEPAD spirit. Uh, NEPAD is really the new partnership for Africa development. So we form partnerships uh, everywhere uh, possible. And uh, specifically, one of the partnership is with uh, the EAT. And we commissioned a um, we commissioned a study that was launched uh, last year in the sideline of the AU summit, the, the, the July AU summit. And the, part, the, 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 the commission was about healthy diets for a sustainable food system. Uh, we know that uh, the food system and the diets that, they, that are uh, actually, uh, the way they actually look will not be conducive for, uh, for sustainable, uh, um, uh, for a sustainable uh, earth. And uh, uh, we have asked uh, uh, Lancet to support us in designing a study that help us further understand what should be done in terms of change, changes of diets. And this, uh, this study is available on the uh, EAT website and also on our website. There's a, I propose here an example of uh, one of the findings and on exactly what should be done when you compare the dietary intakes uh, currently and what should be the uh, objectives in terms of dietary uh, intakes in the future. I have a very limited uh, time, so I'm going to try and wrap up uh, just by uh, summarizing what we're trying to do as a UD in NEPAD. We're looking at systematic change. So we're trying to, we're trying to support member states in locking in uh, a commitment in terms of investment in nutrition, in sustainable food system, uh, within budgetary processes, within uh, 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 adoption of laws. Uh, we mainstream the Paris Climate Change Agreement uh, within the national development plans and also within the national agricultural development plans. So that uh, we're not only looking at programs and projects, but really at, uh, at uh, how to lock these uh, uh, approaches within the national systems. Uh, we also support the member states and regional economic communities uh, with their early warning uh, systems. And uh, through our activities uh, around uh, mobilizing the partners and being the interface between uh, Africa Union, African Union and the uh, stakeholders, we mobilize the financial and human resources for transformation of uh, uh, food systems and uh, climate change mitigation systems. Um, we build capacity, we engage with the partners for implementation and follow-up of actions. And we are also looking at appointing African youth champions for climate change uh, action plans, because we know that we need to include uh, all stakeholders at all level and specifically the youth uh, in rural areas uh, for uh, climate change uh, uh, action plans. Um, I will stop here. If there's any question uh, during the rest of the communication, I'm happy to uh, to respond. Thank you very much. Fatih, thank you very much. That was really great. Uh, you gave us a perspective about AUDA and, and NEPAD and, and, and also the role that it plays on executing you know, regional integration under Agenda 2063. Uh, as well as the focus on the nexus of systems and climate change, especially with the focus on nutrition security, which is well aligned with transformation initiative. So thank you very much. Uh, and this, this will give everybody you know, an opportunity to know a little bit about uh, AUDA, NEPAD, and also in the future to really link up and, and, and build partnership. Uh, now we will go to Karen Basie, who is the Sustainability and Social Policy Senior Manager at one of the Africa's leading ICD company, which is Safaricom. Karen, please, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dawit. So good morning and good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are connecting from. Uh, agriculture is the biggest single employer in Kenya 
uh, accounting for over 60% of total employment in this country. At 60%, you'd expect it to contribute more than the 30% it does to the Kenyan uh, GDP. How is this even possible that 60% of the people are employed in the agricultural sector and it only contributes 30% to the GDP? Well, it's because the average Kenyan farmer doesn't look like the guy on the left. The average Kenyan farmer looks like the lady on the right of my presentation. She farms uh, mostly for subsistence, not on a commercial basis. The average smallholder farmer in Kenya rarely makes surplus that she or he can profit significantly from, even though they spend most money on what they believe is high quality inputs. You see, there are many challenges facing the Kenya's agricultural sector, from inefficient distributed government subsidies to pure weather forecasting, to climate change threats, to parallel yet sadly cheap uh, quality, cheap and poor quality uh, farm inputs. And it is because of all these things that our farmers in Kenya cannot compete with their counterparts in America, Europe, and Asia, despite here in Kenya, where we are enjoying best climate and some soils. So many smallholder farmers in Kenya will remain or remain small uh, holder farmers forever with no quantum leap in income to allow them to grow to allow them to, uh, to grow. So these are just the challenges I've talking about. And if you look at uh, some of the other challenges that face uh, the farmer is uh, they have no access to credit. They have a lot of uh, post-loss associated, uh, post-loss harvest associated, and they struggle. Agribusinesses in Kenya are really struggling. So at Safaricom, we asked ourselves, what can we do to transform the lives of smallholder farmers and therefore the fortunes of, of this uh, agricultural sector. So we came up with a solution called DigiFarm. So in Safaricom, we believe in harnessing the power of digital technologies to pilot, accelerate, and scale innovative ideas with high potential for impact in food, agriculture, and climate. So what is DigiFarm? DigiFarm is an integrated mobile platform that offers farmers convenient, one-stop access to a suite of information and financial services, including quality products, customized information on farming best practices, on climate change, weather patterns, access to credit and credit facilities, and uh, also information. The farmers can share information and transact with their fellow uh, farmers. So what is the vision of DigiFarm? The vision of DigiFarm is to make the smallholder farmer wealthier from their same piece of land by addressing the below gaps. So we look at knowledge on best farming practices and quality inputs. We look at access to financial uh, services, credit, uh, climate uh, crop insurance. Then we look at access to markets. This is what we found that the farmers really struggle with. And DigiFarm as a solution is here to help farmers uh, bridge the gaps I have just mentioned. So you may ask me, how does it work? The whole concept is behind um, a buyer, buyer-driven demand. So we look at what do the buyers, what does the market want? And so then we profile the different farmers and they register in the system and we work with our county governments here in Kenya to register these farmers and profile the farmers who could grow or who have potential to do this or interested farmers. So once the farmer profiling is done and the farmers are part of the system, we look at input packages provided, ideally mapped to DigiFarm depots. So we have depots across the country where the farmers can go to, to get the inputs they need. Then we give them loans and insurance. So there's a, the size of land is determined by the package, the input package you get. So we have a loan tenor system for them and it is determined by the value chain. So in case you're a sunflower farmer, you have three months loan. The, then we have the buyer. So the buyer in this case uh, helps in uh, the production. So the buyer, we know what the buyer wants. So we produce specifically with the farmers for the buyer and the farmers learn and how to harvest and all that. When the crop is ready, the farmers take them to um, a designated collection center where the buyer will assess the quality, then the payment is made via our mobile money platform that is M-Pesa. 
So DG Farm features self-registration where as a farmer, you opt in, we don't force you, you opt in. You can access information, as I've said, about livestock, about crops, about best farming practices, weather patterns, insurance, uh, and that kind of information. Then you can get discounted farm input. So if you're a farmer on this platform, we have farm depots uh, that we've partnered with where the farmer can go and get discounted quality products that they can use for their farms. They also get loan facilities on the platform where they can use to buy the seeds and everything. And when they harvest, they do pay back. Then we have also the DG Soko. So DG Soko is the digital market. So registers farmer, farmers have access to market services where they can sell their products at favorable, uh, at favorable rates. So what does this look like on the ground? So I'm just showing you a, a cross section of pictures where farmers can redeem inputs in one of the engineering depots. Engineering is a place in Kenya, engineer. Then we do soil analysis. So we help the farmers do soil analysis so that you're not just over fertilizing or under fertilizing your, your farm. So you have a soil analysis uh, report. This is just some of the farmers that we have interacted with. We have sunflower farmers in Makueni. We have potato farmers in uh, Marakwet. We also have farm barazas where the farmers sit down and they're educated on agriculture and uh, irrigation. Because most of uh, our, our struggles here in Kenya the farmers depend on rain-fed agriculture. So in some places, we do encourage irrigation so that farming is uh, continuous throughout the year. So what are some of the challenges and opportunities that we see in this area? So we see that digitization of farming is a great thing, but access to platforms in rural areas and the targeted farmers. These farmers are small-scale farmers, so they have uh, problems uh, accessing internet as well as uh, having phones that are internet uh, ready. But Digifarm runs on a USSD uh, platform, but for them to learn more, they may need to move here. Then we are looking at opportunities to use drones to collect real-time in-depth data on food, agriculture, natural disasters, damages to them. So that's an area where there's great opportunity. We see a lot of locust and fo uh, fall arm armyworms and early warning systems. And I think Stephen hinted to this in his presentation, uh, as well as hinting to digitization of agriculture. Then we look at climate change predictions and early warning. I think here in Kenya, the rain has become unpredictable. So we have unpredictable weather patterns, so planting seasons and so on. So if you're a farmer who depends solely on rain-fed agriculture, then you have a problem, but we see it as an opportunity for farmers to be able to tap into. Then looking at the, the future and where we are going in terms of digital services, there's still opportunity to use IoT, Internet of Things, uh, for data analytics on climate and agriculture so that the farmers get real-time uh, information and we can do the analytics for them. So I'll stop here and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions in regards to my presentation. Thank you. Karen, thank you very much for giving us the perspective from uh, the Safari Com side and the role that digital uh, platforms such as Digifarm can play as a one-stop shop. Uh, now we will go to uh, Rikin Gandhi, who is the CEO of Digital Green to give us uh, the insight about what Digital Green is doing and, and how it is also aligned with the Transformation Initiative. Thank you very much, um, and Rikin, over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Tawit. Uh, so uh, imagine you're an agricultural extension officer tasked with training farmers on a climate-smart agricultural practice. Farms are remote and terrains difficult to navigate. Communities are large and diverse. Governments around the world have built large armies on the ground to help farmers plan ahead and cope. But even in countries like Ethiopia that have made major investments in having more than 60,000 extension agents, it still is a daunting challenge given the sheer number and diversity of farmers. There's also the issue of motivation uh, for farmers to trust an extension agent coming in from the outside, the generic information that may not always be relevant, and the natural biases that farmers will have uh, toward realizing rewards uh, in the present. So at the same time, though, farmers already exchange information with each other about what crops they grow and, what, and how they grow them with their families and with their neighbors. Digital tools, in line with the report's recommendation around helping farmers make better choices, 
have the opportunity to build on these existing social networks that the farmers already have with one another to create incentives, some of which may not be always be entirely on money, to start farmers on a ladder of achievement where they can literally be seen as a role model farmer amongst their peers. And at Digital Green, we partner with public extension systems like those of the governments of Ethiopia, Rwanda, and Kenya to produce short eight to 10 minute testimonial videos and demonstrations that are by farmers and for farmers to share best practices uh, related to climate uh, and natural resource management practices uh, to increase their sustainability of uh, their economic as well as environmental uh, well-being. Now, these videos are screened by uh, to more than 500,000 odd farmers in, in the case of Ethiopia by the country's uh, government development agents amongst uh, various farmer development groups. Data and feedback is collected uh, to inform and, and uh, inform the production distribution of the next set of videos. And these videos feature all sorts of natural resource management, water conservation, soil, uh, locust, uh, and fall army war mitigation measures. Uh, but really, the first question that people ask when they watch these videos is not about the economics of the practice, but rather, what's the name of the person in the video and which village is he or she from? Uh, now, as the Meher season begins in Ethiopia, uh, digital means of engaging extension agents, especially given the uh, limitations of travel that COVID-19 has introduced, becomes all the more important. Uh, and not just to push information out to rural communities, but also to gather uh, data and feedback back from the communities as well as the extension agents about what is working, what is not working, what are other issues. And that's where the work that others are doing with uh, including the Agricultural Transformation Agency with using IVR um, and telegram groups uh, can really be uh, instrumentative in that regard. Further, uh, you know, obviously better information can boost crop or animal yields, but that doesn't always necessarily translate into more money into farmers' pockets. And the current pandemic has obviously exposed the fact that farmers are often having uh, surplus production, um, that they are having difficulty to sell, while there is strong consumer demand, including in adjacent uh, village communities to these farmer producers, uh, where there is a supply-demand mismatch. And government and research centers themselves also have challenges of having a great sense of what exactly is taking place um, given the COVID uh, situation. At the same time, there is a growing uh, group of startups uh, in the agri-tech space across East Africa uh, that are developing all sorts of solutions from precision agriculture to IoT to drones and marketplaces uh, for inputs and offtake that now have an opportunity in line with the report's recommendation of driving social change for more sustainable decision making that a real movement that engages youth uh, across uh, the region uh, can create opportunities for convergence and coordination across these various interventions across the agricultural and food system. And that's where the role of technology and data uh, can build layers uh, of an enabling environment of connectivity and data sharing together with capital, uh, including venture capital and, and government investment that can really drive public and private collaboration and that could uh, be seen as building ultimately a farm stack of services that build on top of one another to create greater and greater value for both farmers as well as consumers alike. Ultimately, the climate, smart, food, and agricultural divide won't be closed, of course, by technology alone. Things like physical infrastructure, human capital, political institutions, and finance are necessary foundations to any amplification that uh, technology can add. Uh, we found success by partnering with government, NGO, and private sector agencies already working with farming communities. And that's really what will ultimately result in uh, advances of driving towards sustainability and climate smart food and agricultural systems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rickin, uh, for that insight. Uh, I think uh, so. I think we're running a little bit late, uh, so unfortunately, there will be no time for question and answer session. So, uh, with brief remarks, I will go ahead and 
in close the session. But before I do that, I would like to use this opportunity and thank all our panelists for joining us and giving us their insights. I would like to also thank our audience for actively participating. A number of questions came forward from 84ATA, the Eastern African Farmers Union, AUD, NEPAD, uh, Safaricom, as well as Digital Green, but, but we didn't have time to entertain all. So we encourage you all to continue to interact with us through the social media channels as, or, as well as the Hover app. Uh, uh, now I would like to invite you all uh, to the upcoming live session that will be hosted from Rome, Italy on driving social change for more sustainable decisions. Uh, and with this brief remark, I would like to thank you all and, and continue to be engaged both with us and, and also download the report and by visiting or by joining other sessions. Uh, thank you, gen uh, gentlemen. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and, and all the panelists. And, and over to you, uh, Ram.